first press conference for physicians, friends, physicians, friends, and family for a better Vermont. My name is Guy Page. I'm the advocacy director. We have a lineup of speakers, uh, which has changed a little bit due to the weather. And uh, we'll ask you to hold your questions until afterwards. Okay. First thing I wanted to point out is uh, the latest news. I believe I sent you a link of the Emerson College poll uh, that finds that a majority of, of respondents do not support marijuana legalization of any kind in a, when decriminalization is an option. And to us, that's very significant news uh, in Vermont, where we are a decrim state. The second thing I wanted to point out, uh, we have uh, the Jonathan Calkins of the Rand Corporation gave a presentation to the Vermont Department of Health earlier this week. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, presentations that he, he offered uh, had to do with what is going on in Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C., of course, legalized personal use. And one of the, the arguments made in House Judiciary this year was we need to legalize because too many uh, young people, especially young people of color, uh, are being arrested and it's just, it's just not fair. What they have discovered in Washington, D.C. is that Arrests went up from 142 for, for uh, uh, public intoxication of marijuana to 400 in one year after legalization, including many people of color. So the idea that there's going to be fewer arrests in a personal use legalization environment has not been borne out. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, and the question could be asked, why? Why has that happened? I, I think the, the, the best answer I've heard so far is, frankly, it's just spillover. More people are using it, and they're coming out in the streets, and in a state of public intoxication, and more arrests are happening. There are also more arrests for, uh, for uh, possession and sale as well. So, uh, the third point that I was going to raise before we get to our speakers was on some information that we are developing on drug recognition experts. It is 90% done, but I'm afraid, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not completely ready yet. My hope is that early uh, next week sometime, I'll be able to send that to you. And the gist of it is that uh, DREs are a good program, but there, there may be some, some issues as far as uh, uh, how it will work in Vermont. And David Rattu, uh, UVM uh, researcher, professor, uh, child psychiatrist, was scheduled to come and deliver this paper. He has been stopped by the storm, unfortunately. So if it's a page and a half, and I'm going to read it, and then I will give anyone who wants copies, and I can forward it to you as well. Uh, David Rutu, MD. I've been asked to say a little bit about what science actually knows on the link between marijuana use and opiate use. I know that it would be very helpful and convenient for some people to believe that cannabis use might actually help Vermont's serious problem with opiates, but unfortunately, the weight of the science leads to the opposite conclusion. That is not to deny the existence of the many people who use cannabis without developing opiate addictions, or to deny the existence of some people who have been able to substitute opiate use for cannabis. However, when you are making policy you need to look at the net effects and the research indicates that overall, 
More cannabis leads to more drug problems, not less, and these problems include opiate addiction. This evidence comes from three main sources. First, research in animals that indicate that marijuana primes the brain to seek out more drugs. Second, a number of systematic research studies, many of them quite new, are showing that marijuana use at, at time more than doubles the risk of opiate use disorder three to four years later, even after controlling for other factors. It nearly triples the risk among people with pain. Third, there are troubling state statistics that are being reported more and more. In 2016, for example, Colorado witnessed the highest number of opiate overdose deaths in history. This research parallels what we are already seeing in Vermont, such as the recently disclosed toxicology report showing high levels of both marijuana and opiates in the driver responsible for one of the most horrific crashes in the state's recent history. Sure, it's possible to find studies that do not support these conclusions, just like you can find studies that don't support global warming. But it is important to look at the overall conclusions made by people who are in the best position to evaluate the totality of the evidence and who are not subject to personal or financial conflicts of interest when it comes to marijuana. Even if you accept the assertion that the science is not completely settled on this issue, a sensible response might be that this is a good reason not to plunge ahead with a political decision that would be nearly impossible to reverse. When I work with adolescents in practice, I try to help them resist the pressure when peers tell them to do something because everyone else is doing it too. I feel like our state government needs that support now. There are a lot of Vermonters who really do not believe the answer for our drug problem is more drugs. To our elected officials, I want to remind them that this message is out there now in this room. If you go ahead with legalization, nobody is going to buy the excuse five or ten years from now that you were misled by a well-financed lobbying effort telling you the same thing that cigarette companies told you decades ago. You'll need to own this yourself. However, I think I can speak for everyone standing here that years from now, all of us would be much more content saying thank you to our legislature than I told you so. And that was the testimony of David Rattu, Dr. David Rattu. I will hand you all copies of that, and if you need it in electronic version, I can send that to you as well. Our next speaker is Dr. John Hughes, who is in an eminent researcher, researcher and expert on drug addiction at the University of Vermont. Dr. Hughes. Thank you. Um, I'm a professor um, here at UVM and um, do clinical work in helping people stop uh, drug problems and do research in that area as well. We've done studies on marijuana, for example. UVM was one of the first uh, places to describe and document that there is a marijuana withdrawal syndrome and that, that withdrawal syndrome can lead people to not be able to function normally. Um, so what I want to talk about mostly today is the harms. And the reason I want to do that is whenever we have a policy, we want to talk about the risk and the benefits. And we'll talk about, so I'm going to talk about the harms first and the benefits later. But the major thing I want to do is echo what, what Dave said. Dave said you can have studies this way and have studies that way, but what do the experts do? What are the people that have no conflicts? And in Vermont, we have seven medical societies who have been against legalization. Now, what other things has the legislature proposed that seven medical societies have said no to doing that? So, I, and I think that comes from several places, okay? First is that when we legalize a substance, we make it less, have less of a, of a stigma. And, and so when we do that, we're gonna increase use. Now, 10% of people who begin marijuana will become addicted to it at some point in their life. So if we have 1,000 kids who use marijuana 
who wouldn't normally have used marijuana, that means there's going to be 100 extra people coming to me for treatment. And right now at UVM, we have a waiting list of 100 to 200 people trying to get into treatment for opioids. And now we're going to add another 100 or more for, for this problem as well. Just doesn't make any sense. The other thing is that when we increase availability, we're going to increase the problems, even if it's well-intentioned. So Vermont is a wonderful example of that. We have a terrible opioid problem. And where did that opioid problem arise? It arose in part because about 10 or 15 years ago, we were encouraged that we were not treating pain adequately, and we needed to do a better job of that. And the way to do a better job of that was to more freely use opioids. Now, that was a well-intentioned effect, but it had a side effect. And that side effect was whenever you increase the availability of drug, you're going to have problems. And that's because when you increase marijuana use, you're just going to have more people walking around intoxicated. And when you have more intoxicated people, you're going to have more car, problem, car accidents, you're going to have uh, more people, kid, excuse me, fewer kids that are able to complete high school or college. It's just, it's just, gonna, it's just uh, uh, an inevitability that that's going to happen. The other thing is um, that we do know, American Psychiatric Association and several organizations have, have shown that increasing marijuana use, we're not exactly sure that it causes mental illness, but we certainly know two things. One is it makes it worse. There's no doubt about that, especially psychoses. And secondly, it makes it much harder to treat. If you, have a, if you currently use marijuana, my ability to get you better is really much, much less than, than it would be otherwise. Now, I think the other thing that we forget about this issue is that many people in the past have used marijuana when they were younger. And the marijuana they were using back younger is what I call over-the-counter marijuana. What we have now is we have prescription strength marijuana that's four to five times more, uh, excuse me, stronger. And so when you have that increased uh, dosage, just like with any drug, you're going to have increased problems. And so when we think about, oh, we're just going to have people at night using this low-grade marijuana, that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is with that higher grade, you're going to have much more addiction. Now, how about the benefits? What are the benefits for legalization? So we have decriminalization. And to me, we got it right with decriminalization. What I want to know is what's going wrong now with decriminalization. It's not like we're arresting kids and throwing them in jail. That doesn't happen anymore. So what's the benefit? Well, people use the term recreational use. And I have to say I hate that term because it suggests that there's no harm. You know, recreational use suggests that, you know, it's just like bicycling. You know, maybe a few people have accidents, but it's no big deal. That's not the same thing with drug use. You cannot talk about recreational drug use without acknowledging the side effects that you're going to have. So let me finish by going back to one of the things I said at the beginning is that you have expert groups, whether it's the American Medical Association, Vermont Medical Societies, um, American Psychiatric Association, all of whom agree on one thing, and that is if you increase availability of marijuana use, you're going to increase problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. And now uh, we have someone who's, whose life, uh, Daryl Rogers, whose life has been uh, uh, tragically impacted by marijuana abuse. Uh, and I will let Daryl tell his own story. Do you know what it's like bury one of your children? I do. Do you know what it's like to walk into the funeral home, walk up to the casket, and lay your hand 
on your child's chest. Feel his, feel his cold, stiff, lifeless body. I do. Do you know what it's like to walk into the front door of your home and look at your wife and tell her that her son is dead? I do. I buried my mother and my father, and I loved them dearly, and that hurt. Over the years, I've attended the funerals of many family and friends, but nothing could prepare me for the intense pain that I would go through the day that I learned that my oldest son, Chase, had died in a wreck. And it's a pain that never goes away. I've talked to other parents who have lost children. It doesn't matter if it's been 20 years, 30 years. The pain is still there. It's a pain that never goes away. What was it that cost my son Chase his life? It was his decision to use marijuana. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Not a doubt at all. I saw what marijuana did to Chase. At one time, he was a vibrant, active young man with ambitions. But I saw marijuana steal his ambitions. He became, he went to a a place where all he wanted to do was just the minimum to get by every day, just so he could lay around and smoke his weed. Just as long as he could do that, that was all he needed. That's where he went to. I had the opportunity to get to hang out with some of his friends, spend some time with some of his friends and get to know them. You know what? They all had one thing in common, that was marijuana. And you know what else they had in common? They couldn't hold down a job for any length of time. Not only could they not hold down a job, some of them wouldn't be able to tell you where they would be spending the night tonight. They would not be able to tell you where their next meal is coming from. Some of them in and out of jail, in and out of rehab. I had the chance to get to know them really, really well. I took one of them into my own home and I took money out of my pocket to send him to California, to Los Angeles, to pay for him to go into treatment. He spent one week there. One week is all he lasted. I also saw marijuana affect, I saw it impair my son Chase's judgment. In fact, one of the last things that he did was go to the park with some friends and smoke a bowl of weed. And after that, Guess what he did? He took his car keys and put them in the hands of an 18-year-old young woman who had never even had a driver's license. And he knew that she didn't have a driver's license. Another young man got in the back. Chase got in the front passenger seat of his own car. And he allowed this young woman to drive them into rush hour traffic on a busy afternoon. She drove what used to be my dad's car off the road at 70 miles per hour and they hit a tree. Chase was killed instantly. It took firefighters almost an hour to get the three occupants out of the car. Seven months after that wreck and only a few weeks prior to what would have been her first court appearance, that young woman poured gasoline all over the floor of her apartment and ignited it. She died the next day in the hospital. She took her own life. I want you to know what marijuana does to people because I've seen it. You know, you're going to hear the testimony of some brilliant people here today, the experts. You're going to hear them give you the science, give you the data, all of that. You know what? It's great, but I personally, I don't need any of that because I saw with my own two eyes what it did to my son. I've seen what it's done to his friends. I've been here to Vermont before. I came in mid-October. I, I, I went to about, I was here for seven days. 
and, and I, I made 15 different appearances. I went to your high schools, some of your high schools here, and I spoke and I talked to some of the young people there. And you know why? I'm not getting paid to do this. I came here because I care about those kids and I care about you. I don't want to see you end up in the same position I'm in. I don't want you to be the one next because it could be your child or it could be your grandchild who's killed by a stoned driver. It could be your child or your grandchild who's next. They could be the ones who are introduced by some of their teenage friends to marijuana and as a result of that end up trying harder drugs and then overdosing. You don't know how many parents I've talked to who have that same story. I don't want you to be the one to experience those things that I've experienced where you walk up to that casket with your dead child's body inside. Think carefully. Think carefully about the choices that you're about to make because it will have a lasting impact on your children and your grandchildren, on the youth of Vermont, on the future of this country. Thank you. Uh, the person who organized that tour for Daryl was a Vermonter named Bob Orlick, who's right here. And he will be reading to us a letter from a, a physician at Ground Zero in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, her name is Karen Randall. And we hope at some point that maybe she can come up to Vermont, but in the meantime, Bob's gonna read a letter from her. Karen would have liked to have been here, but she couldn't be, and uh, the purpose of her being here would to give a window, so it was her idea that looking through that window, you could see what Vermont would be like if uh, they go down this road. Karen worked, works in the third largest uh, emergency practice in the state of Colorado, and she was 18 years at Henry Ford as a teaching physician she had did a residency in pedi uh, pediatrics and in emergency room uh, medicine. She has a unique perspective. She writes this, and it will be in the first person. Thank you for allowing me to speak via written word. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. I am both trained in pediatrics and emergency medicine. I have been the boots on the ground in the emergency department in Colorado since 2013 and have seen rapid and significant changes in my community. We know from both the tobacco industry and the alcohol industry, the true costs to society are almost impossible to calculate. We know that DUI and automobile accidents have increased in the last four years. We know that youth usage, despite a decline in the U.S., is up in states that have legalized. The use of marijuana is being normalized, and our youth children are following suit and using more. Healthy Kids Survey in 2015 showed that 64% of kids in high schools in Pueblo County, Colorado, say that getting marijuana would be easy or very easy. And without a doubt, we know that repeated use, while a youth, actually anyone less than 25 years of age, may lead to long-term changes in the brain. These changes affect the judgment center, among others, make, making decisions about risky behavior more difficult. We know that kids who use are at a markedly increased risk of addiction. We know that marijuana products are being found in junior and high schools with increasing frequency. The edible products, the vaping products, make it possible for the kids to use right there in the classroom. Ask a teacher. Get the opinion of a Colorado teacher about how legalized marijuana has changed the classroom. We know that local businesses have had increasingly difficult time finding employees to work uh, who can pass a drug urine test. Our business here has had to screen, one business had to screen over 70 applicants to fill three positions. We know that utilization of emergency services in the hospital have increased from everything from acute psychosis to overdoses to cannabinoid hyperemesis. You may sit back and think that 
since you don't use marijuana, it won't affect you, but it will. We're all paying the increased hospital costs, the Medicare costs via increased premiums, increased usage of Medicare or Medicaid. We are paying more here for car insurance. We are paying for loss of productive time for individuals that choose to smoke marijuana all day, every day. And if you or one of your children happens to get addicted, yes, addicted, you and your family will pay a lot of money for rehab and drug treatment programs hoping that they work. So many of my friends and coworkers have spent their entire retirement accounts to pay for these services, leaving them at an age where they can't retire. You may have to wait longer in emergency department for your emergency care because I will be taking care of the acutely psychotic patient who is in danger to himself and others. Your children will have to be so very diligent because marijuana is everywhere and use of marijuana is being normalized by so many people. There is no question that they will be exposed to marijuana products and be exposed at a much younger age. Briefly look at the environment. We were promised that legal marijuana would cut down on the number of illegal grows. We know that this is not true. You don't need to take my word for it. Uh, you can Google the, the Department of Natural Resources and illegal grows. They are all over California and Colorado. These grows also bring illegal pesticides, chemicals considered too toxic to be legal in the U.S. from other countries. They are being used to grow their plants. They run off of these plants, leading to toxic chemicals in the water tables and local vegetation, which will ultimately make it into the food chain and, and into your body. Legalized marijuana has been here since 2014. I've been working here from before 2014 to the present time. We were promised so many things. To date, our schools have not improved. Our roads are not safer. Our jails are crowded to overfilling, not to mention falling apart. And Colorado is posting a huge budget deficit this year. Look at the highway statistics. Look at the Department of Natural Resources and illegal grows. Look at the new and emerging medical complications from the use of high dose THC products. After all of this, ask yourself why your politicians are so eager to pass this legislation. Ask them for full disclosure. Do they own, participate, have partnership in the marijuana industry? Why are they doing this? Are they receiving money from the industry? Are their family members involved? I think that you may be surprised by the results that you would hear. Yes, a few people will make a lot of money from the marijuana industry, but the likelihood is that you will pay for that industry even if you don't use marijuana products. Is that what you want? I extend my personal public invitation for the governor or lieutenant governor to come and spend a day with me and see the end point of Colorado's uh, legislation with regards to marijuana. I would like them to come to work with me. They can come to the innumerable homeless sites throughout our state. They can go to our local Walmart and speak to people living in broken down campers in the parking lot. They then can come to my house and I will show them an illegal grow house that is less than a thousand feet from my home. To the legislative branch, considering legalization of any sort, be diligent, be informed. Look beyond what seems like, you know, uh, great revenue. Understand that all ramifications of legalization, listen to what the teachers, the doctors, the police department, the fire departments, and parents of Colorado are experiencing. Have you wondered why so many of these people are speaking out Really get to know what you're getting into. Decide if that's what you want for your children in your neighborhood. Be informed. And thank you for your time, Karen Randall. And I have copies uh, for anybody that would like it. We have a Vermont drug expert, uh, drug abuse prevention expert, Ginny Burley, with us. And she will now speak to her area of expertise. So I have a, a little disclaimer here. I'm a last minute sub in this role because I live in East Montpelier and could get here and Mariah Sanderson, who was going to uh, fill this role, lives in Burlington and could not. Um, so Catherine, this just went closed. So I'm going to read a borrowed speech on a borrowed computer um, because I believe that uh, the role of substance abuse prevention is critical in this conversation. Um, 
we in the prevention community, and I work in the prevention community here in Montpelier, um, are committed to preventing increase in youth use of all substances. So I'll skip the part about her kids and get right to the uh, prevention community is concerned about the direction our state and our country are taking with marijuana policy. I believe that if we continue to ignore science and rush to legalize marijuana, it will be one of the biggest public health mistakes of at least my lifetime. Research very clearly shows that legalization increases access to the substance and that increased access equals increased use. Our nation's legal drugs are more accessible, available, and are viewed as safer because they are legal, so they are used at dramatically higher rates than our illegal ones. If, like me, you've read the Vermont Health Impact Assessment of Marijuana Legalization, you know that legalization does not bring good news for our state's long-term outcomes. It predicts that legalization will bring increases in youth use, traffic crashes, ER visits, mental health issues, addiction, treatment needs, and worsening academic performance. Before Vermont moves any further toward policies that increase access to marijuana, we have to address the health impacts of increased use and increased addiction from this policy change. Smart marijuana policies should recognize that marijuana use has ill effects on health and should be discouraged. The rate of marijuana use in Vermont is some of the highest in the nation, and we need to do work as a state first to better inform citizens about the risks associated with use today. Vermont does not need more marijuana use. We need healthy brains. Vermont does not need more marijuana use. We need an educated, sober workforce. Vermont does not need more marijuana use. We need safe, sober drivers. Vermont does not need more drug use. We need policy that supports healthy kids and healthy communities. Vermont does not need access to more drugs. We need policymakers to make an investment in effective substance abuse prevention strategies. Just a, a little personal aside, at that point, I'm funded for two hours a week to work on marijuana issues and nine hours a week to work on tobacco, and that's all I got. So support for funding for prevention is not abundant. I have often heard proponents of legalization say that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol or other drugs. And in a few ways that is true, a person cannot consume a lethal dose of marijuana. When someone is using or high on marijuana, the incidence of people taking physical risks is much rarer than with alcohol. But our only measure of harm cannot be death. The rates among people who use, who meet the diagnostic criteria for dependence on marijuana are higher than alcohol 21% for marijuana, 13% for alcohol. Data shows that marijuana dependence or addiction has been continuing to increase and the frequency that regular users are using is increasing. They are using more often. Basically our data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health is showing that today's marijuana tends to generate more problems with addiction than alcohol. It will take a good five to 10 years to know what the consequences will be of legalization in the states that rushed to legalize. There's been increasing research documenting the harmfulness of the potent marijuana available today, but right now there's still a lot of conflicting evidence. We need to have time as more studies are done and science will help us determine what is the best path forward to improve current policies. Although I hear we're not supposed to follow science anymore according to Congress. What would we want to increase the marijuana use issues Vermont, why would we want to increase the marijuana use issues Vermont already has? What kind of benefit could Vermont possibly get from legalization that would justify this kind of public health risk? I struggle with how hard it is to raise my kids to make good choices in the face of so much media that glorifies and normalizes drug and alcohol use. We need our policymakers and communities to make decisions based on the current and relevant research from reputable sources and to support building communities that make the healthy choice the easy choice for our residents and visitors. Specifically, I ask our legislators, again, to slow down. When it comes to creating sensible drug policy, this should not be a race to see who can get there first. Regardless of how legislators think they can keep legal marijuana as a homegrown product, the reality is that all legal drugs in the U.S. are eventually produced by commercial industries that are motivated to increase consumption in order to increase profits. Lobbyists and special interest groups have been spending time and money across the US and in Vermont to
to downplay the challenges of legalization because of their ties to the business industries that will profit from a new mood-altering drug they can market to Vermonters. We are currently in the midst of an opiate epidemic, that is in part because 20 years ago we allowed easy access to highly addictive drugs we did not fully understand. And the companies who could profit off those drugs helped shape the narrative and told us they were safe. We cannot allow ourselves to do the same thing again. I urge legislators to use more caution this time, to wait for more information from the reports from the Governor's Commission on Marijuana, to wait for more information from the states that rushed into this. We cannot afford to make the same mistake again. Vermont does not need policies that increase access to more drugs. We need investment from our leaders in policies that preserve, promote, and improve public health. And thank you, Mariah Sanderson. Thank you, Jimmy. Sure. I do need to make one correction. Uh, the source of this, of the DC increase in arrests, was not uh, the Rand Corporation, it was the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Okay? Now, our next speaker uh, is a New Jersey attorney, legal expert. And what I find most, he has a very long and impressive resume. But what I find most impressive is that he is a, a former uh, faculty member on uh, drug crime at John Jay Criminal College, the, the, the Harvard of, of criminal law is, is John Jay. And he taught there. So, Dave Evans. Uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, I live right across the lake in New York State, up near Plattsburgh, and um, I'm very concerned about uh, mar marijuana being legalized in Vermont coming over to New York. Uh, I like Vermont a lot. Uh, the first time I was in Vermont was visiting my brother who went to Middlebury, and I got introduced to Vermont maple syrup and maple sugar candy. And I would suggest to you that you look at the state rules about protecting maple syrup and maple sugar from pesticides and contamination and making sure that it's pure. And then look, have you done anything even similar to that to protect people from impurities in marijuana? You have not in this, in this bill. Um, I headed up the, and by the way, my daughter graduated has a master's degree from Middlebury, so I chose to have my daughter educated here because I thought it was a state of very sensible people. Um, I also used to run the drunk driving program in New Jersey, and um, what's going to happen if you legalize is, first of all, adult marijuana use is going to go up. In the states that have legalized it, adult use has gone up 40%. So that means that all of the mayhem connected with people being intoxicated also goes up. In the state of Washington, uh, drug driving fatalities due to marijuana doubled. In Colorado, it's now one out of every five fatalities there. Highway fatalities are connected with marijuana. So people are going to die in Vermont. More people are going to die so that some people can get high. If that's a fair exchange for you, then vote for this bill. Um, the, uh, the big problem with marijuana today is that it is not the marijuana that I smoked when I was in college. Uh, when I smoked back in the 60s, it was maybe 2 or 3% THC. They now have marijuana products that are 99% THC. You have a handout here about that. Under this bill, this will become legal in Vermont. You'll be able to produce concentrates that are 99% THC. As a matter of fact, the bill even talks about that. Uh, it says that if you're going to make concentrates, uh, you can't use butane. Why not? Because it's a carcinogen. But you can use CO2 or other ways of making the concentrates, getting the oils and the concentrates out of the marijuana. Um, something else that should scare you. A study was done of teenagers. Uh, one in five of the students admitted to driving a car within an hour of using marijuana. Uh, so. Uh, are kids going to have more access to marijuana if this bill gets passed? Absolutely. This bill is reckless when it comes to protecting children from diversion of marijuana. Uh, it places the responsibility for preventing diversion of marijuana 
to children, to people who are going to be using the marijuana. Uh, you'll be allowed to grow marijuana in your home. Children live in your home. And the only thing the bill says about that is that you have to take some measures to make sure that people under the age of 21 don't have access to this. Now, how much marijuana is going to be able to be grown in people's homes? Well, you can have up to uh, an ounce, uh, and then you can have up to two mature marijuana plants. A marijuana plant can be six feet tall and four feet wide. In my handout, we've got uh, examples of it there. A typical marijuana plant, one plant, can generate one to five pounds of marijuana a year, especially when it's well cared for. So one to five pounds of marijuana a year, depending on whether it's average marijuana or Simpsonella, um, an ounce can generate between 60 and 120 joints. So you do the math on five pounds, 16 ounces, five pounds, a marijuana plant that you'll be able to grow in your home will be able to generate 9,000 joints. And then since you have two of them, we're now getting up to 19,000 joints. So that's about 50 joints a day if you're going to smoke marijuana. Um, all this marijuana is going to be laying around. As a matter of fact, the bill provides that you can store marijuana and it's not counted uh, as, as an ounce. And that means that all of that is going to be uh, diverted to kids. So people in your neighborhood, your next door neighbor, is going to be able to produce, every time your kid goes over to that person's house, they're going to potentially have access to thousands of joints, marijuana that's going to be in that home legally. So how are you going to stop kids from getting access to it? Uh, that means you can never leave the kids alone, you can never go shopping, you always have to check. Now, uh, kids are pretty you know, aggressive about these types of things. I used to steal my parents' alcohol. Uh, I would water it down so they wouldn't know. Kids are going to get access to this. There's nothing in the bill that says anything about having to lock it up, how you're going to lock it up, how it's going to be certified, and how is anybody going to find out that you're not properly caring for the marijuana? Uh, nobody is monitoring this. It's going to be up to pod users, pod heads, to monitor the diversion of marijuana. Uh, also, the penalties for kids under the age of 21 are very minimal under this, and so drug pushers, marijuana pushers, are going to start using kids, just like they do in the big cities with heroin, using kids to sell and pick up and deliver the marijuana, because they know if the kid gets caught, there's going to be very little penalty uh, on that child. Um, I appreciated the doctor from Colorado inviting the governor and lieutenant governor to come to Colorado. There's two Colorado tours. There's the official government tour, and if you get that tour, you go there and you think everything is hunky-dory. Then there is the real tour, and we have given legislators both tours. I know in New Jersey they got the government tour, they came back and said we got to legalize pot. In Massachusetts, a bunch of the senators came out and got our tour, and they came out and said there's no way we want to do this. Now unfortunately it got through on a ballot initiative. But they got to see what's really going on there. Pot infuses the culture there. Uh, it becomes a very dominant thing. And uh, the school officials have all kinds of problems now. The lunchroom smell of marijuana because kids are bringing it in in the form of edibles. School performance has gone down. School disciplinary problems have gone up. Read the, uh, there's a great editorial by the Colorado Springs Gazette that talks about all of the school related problems that they're having. Uh, with marijuana. Disciplinary issues have gone up. Uh, if that's what you want in the state, fine. Uh, let's talk about marijuana growing. How do you grow marijuana? Well, you want to keep bugs out, so you use pesticides, you use all kinds of chemicals. Study after study after study after study. Smithsonian, Scientific American, all over the place. There was just a study in California. California has had medical, this is medical marijuana for 10 years. And they did testing of medical marijuana products in California in August. 80% of them. Now, this is a state that's had in, you know, legalization, really, of marijuana for that period of time. 80% were full of pesticides, heavy metals, and fungus. So when people grow it in their homes, are they going, is anyone going to be monitoring their use of pesticides, heavy metals, grow products, fungus? Is anybody even going to know what a marijuana fungus looks like to take it off before somebody inhales it? So 80% in California, under regulations as loose as the ones that, that are going to be in this bill, this bill has absolutely no regulation at all on the production of marijuana, 
are going to be loaded with chemicals. And that's a state that had over 10 years of experience with this. Uh, this is an extremely irresponsible bill because you provide no guidance to people, no standards, nothing. You do very little to keep it out of the hands of children. Um, how much time do we want to get for questions? Uh, I can go on for a couple more minutes. We have one more statement. Okay. Uh, someone can read a paragraph from a, from a letter, and then we will go to questions for any and all. Okay, well, uh, let me just end with this then. Years ago, the National uh, Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws was trying to promote marijuana, and they came up with the idea of medical marijuana. We have a videotape of them laughing about this. Uh, you know, they didn't think anybody would buy it, but people did. So what happened is that medical marijuana allowed the marijuana industry to gain influence and to gain money. They took the money and then put it into trying to get marijuana legalized. Uh, we are with marijuana right now where we were with tobacco in the 1950s. The public is just starting to be aware there's a huge problem here. But the lobbying and the influence of the tobacco industry is so strong, it hasn't offset the science yet. So those of you who are legislators who are considering this, think about, are you being conned by the marijuana industry? They do focus groups. They know what will appeal to you. They use racial justice issues. They use other things like this that appeal to your emotions rather than your head. Uh, I would urge you to use your head because you're placing a bomb in the health of Vermont that's going to explode. These people are not going to stop at this, okay? They're going to move on to commercialization, which they've done in every other single state. You're going to be seeing advertisements aimed at young people with Santa Claus. My favorite is one from Colorado that has a scantily clad girl, and they're advertising a back-to-school special for marijuana. That's coming to Vermont if you open this door. Commercialization will come in because they'll come in with all kinds of arguments about why it should be sold and this and that and how much money you're going to make and how it's fair to racial minorities and they'll come up with all the arguments. So when you see anybody from the marijuana industry you're representing marijuana, think tobacco. Think big tobacco industry and how they conned the American public. I can remember when I was a kid seeing cigarette advertisements. So many doctors smoke camels. They're soothing to the throat. They advertise tobacco for women to lose weight. This is what's being thrown at you now. They've studied you. They know what makes you tick. And you're getting conned. So don't be conned. Put the health of the children first. Don't be stupid. Thanks. Thank you. Ed, Ed Baker will read an excerpt from a letter by Libby Stite, who is a psychiatric addiction expert from Colorado. And then we'll have questions. Hello and thank you. I want to say uh, before I read this excerpt that I agree with everything uh, Dr. Stite has to say. And it's interesting because as part of this letter, there's an ad from Colorado and it's Santa Claus. And it's at uh, a dispensary, a medical and you know, non-medical uh, dispensary of marijuana. Cut rate deals, and I can remember when I was a kid, Santa Claus had a carton of Lucky Strike cigarettes in his, in his bag. Um, so your, your, the last speaker's points are well taken. So this is just a brief quote because uh, Dr. Stite echoes a lot of what every other speaker has said today. Dr. Stite is a board certified addiction psychiatrist. She's been in the field for a number of decades. She's the executive director of the Circle uh, program in Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo seems to be the epicenter of marijuana growth and use in Colorado. <clears throat> the Healthy Kids survey in 2015 indicated that 30.1 percent of teenagers in Pueblo reported past month use of marijuana, <clears throat> the highest in Colorado. We have the highest incidence of suicide in teenagers and the highest rate of heroin overdoses in Colorado. The correlation between these and the use of marijuana is very strong. She concludes with we must dispel the myths that marijuana is safe and that it is safer than alcohol. 
This is a burgeoning public health nightmare that combines the worst of alcohol and the worst of nicotine. I hate to think that we will continue down this road of allowing the marijuana industry to put out false data about how great marijuana is and how much money your estate will make while we lose a generation of children to addiction and the threat of serious mental health problems. She says, good luck in your decision, and I hope I help some in terms of education, educating you about our real life experience with what our governor has termed a social experiment. Well, uh, now's a good time. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, the experts who are here, uh, be glad to, uh, Dave, Dr. Hughes, any other experts who are here, uh, please uh, feel free. A lot of the information deals with the consequences of uh, what might happen if this bill passes. I guess I would wonder, what would your what would your strategies be for dealing with marijuana now? Uh, we know it's out there. We know people are using marijuana. Um, what you know? What is going to? What should be done, even if it's not legalized? Well, I, I think we should do what we did back in when. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What What happened during the parents' movement? The, the high point of drug use in the United States was in the late 1970s, and um, we. Uh, uh, formed the parents' movement. Uh, we were able to reduce drug use overall by about 50%. It's a total lie that the war on drugs didn't work. It's absolutely not true. Under the Bush administration, marijuana use among young people went down 25%. So um, as young people perceive that marijuana is dangerous, use goes down. If you pass this law, the kids are not going to perceive that marijuana is dangerous. They're going to think it's okay because my next door neighbor is growing it or dad is growing it. So education on what is really going on with marijuana today, uh, the education is not caught up with the science. Anybody that looks at the recent science about marijuana, the medical science, the mental health science, uh, all, all of the organizations that can weigh in and that scientifically weighed in said it's dangerous, it affects mental health, and it causes addiction to other drugs. The American Psychiatric Association, National Academy of Sciences, the World Health Organization, the U.S. Surgeon General, and the National Institute of Health all have weighed in on that, okay? So the science is there, but it's not into everybody's head yet. So uh, people perceive of marijuana as being this kind of benign substance like it was during the Woodstock weed period. So increase education. Our leaders need to speak out. They need to say, this is not good. This is what marijuana is really all about. Our legislative leaders, your governor needs to have courage to come out and say that, to be a leader like it was done in previous generations where presidents and governors made statements like that. Uh, and to also confront the marijuana industry, confront their lobbying. Uh, when we go into schools and talk to them about marijuana, kids say, but it's medicine. It's good for you. Okay? Why do they think it's medicine? Well, they think it's medicine in your state because you have medical marijuana. So how do you argue against that? So you have to uh, do education, have leaders speak up, and have people that have the courage to confront the marijuana industry, just like it ultimately happened with tobacco, okay? We confronted tobacco when people started dying from it. Both my parents died from tobacco-related illnesses, and that got everybody's attention. And you're gonna start seeing in the next five, six, seven, eight, ten years, all of the damage about marijuana is starting to come out. Uh, spontaneous abortions, child uh, birth defects, all this stuff is now gonna start coming up because now it's really being intensively studied. Uh, there's also a myth that you can't study marijuana, baloney. The National Academy of Sciences came out with a report. They looked at 10,000 studies. There's 10,000 studies about the dangers of marijuana. The science is clear on it. Uh, you know, peer-reviewed, scientifically valid studies. So that's what I would do if I was in Vermont. I'd ask my governor to stand up and say, this is wrong and we're not gonna allow this to damage our children. I wanna, I wanna add one, one point that um, I think it's really important as, as adults that we uh, be very careful about the messaging that we're offering our adolescents especially. 
when, when we use the term recreational marijuana, I think that's a very misleading term. It equates marijuana, smoking, a dangerous drug, with recreation. What is the message that a teenager is going to take away from that kind of statement? <clears throat> smoking marijuana is good. Smoking marijuana is somehow, you know, not harmful. It's recreation. I think we need to portray it as the self-administration of a dangerous, harmful drug. It is not recreation. I'm all for banning that word. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll bring another point. Let's say you know that your next door neighbor is growing marijuana and using marijuana. Are you going to be comfortable having your kid go over to their house with a stoned parent? I wouldn't be. When I, my kids ever went to a party, I called the parents up and I said, okay, what's going on? I don't want alcohol at that party. Otherwise, my kid isn't going to go. Uh, are you going to feel comfortable and safe and secure with a marijuana-using parent that's got thousands of joints in their house driving your kid to the soccer game? I don't think so. I'm not going to want to do it. I don't want my surgeon under the influence of marijuana. I'm a lawyer. I wouldn't want my lawyer being under the influence of marijuana when he goes into court. Adult use is going to go up. You pass this bill, adult use is going up. All those dangers are going to increase. And I think if you do this, 10 years from now, people are going to look at you and say, what the hell were you thinking? How could you have been so stupid to have fallen for this con job from a marijuana industry that doesn't care about people but only cares about profits? They're advertising to children. Okay, We don't let the tobacco companies do that, but they're allowed to do it in Colorado. There's a cannabis tourism map that is given out at the zoo. When kids go to the zoo in Colorado, they have a, uh, you know, brochures out there for tourist things in Colorado, and there's a cannabis tourism map that any kid can pick up. You think that's okay? I don't think so. It's being promoted uh, as being safe and, and, and recreation. Most Vermonters understand that marijuana is objectively less harmful than alcohol, and they're ready to see the state begin treating it that way. Well, first of all, that's a pretty low bar, <laughs> considering <laughs> how many traffic accidents we have with alcohol, how many people I see in treatment. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a fair comparison um, there. Also, um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Uh, we've heard a lot about the bill. And uh, there's a bill that is expected to be voted upon in the first few days of the session that is uh, um, you know, small amounts to vote mm -hmm. session. And then there's the bill that's contemplated down the road, which mm -hmm. is a Oregon, Colorado style tax regulated system. Do you have a preference between those two? Well, clearly, I prefer the former than the latter because the second has. Shown here, is we get into commercialization. And once we get into commercialization, we get into big tobacco being part of it, you know, that sort of thing. I think the major issue here is that normalizing youth use, okay? So Brian Flynn at UVM did a wonderful study. What he did is he went into high schools and asked kids, how many of your friends smoke tobacco? And they all overestimated it. They all said 30, they all said 40 or 50 percent. He gave them data that it was 20 percent. With that one interaction, he decreased smoking in high school. Okay? So kids do things that they see other people normalizing, okay? And that's my real concern, is sending the wrong message. And that's why I think we got it right with decriminalization. Because we're not throwing kids in jail, we're still telling kids this is not good to do. Uh, so that's why I like decriminalization. If, if I can comment on that alcohol, about alcohol uh, being more dangerous, uh, let's just look at that data a little bit. Uh, we've got maybe two-thirds of the country uses alcohol on a regular, fairly regular basis. We have maybe 14 to 20 million people, one-tenth of that amount using marijuana. So the perception is that it's less dangerous because there's so few people using it compared to alcohol. We see more alcohol because more people use it. If you commercialize it, okay, you're going to start seeing the use of marijuana climb and the public perception that it is equally dangerous. In the state of Washington right now, alcohol, 
fatalities, drunk driving fatalities, are the same uh, with the drugs, uh, that it increased by 50% in the state of Washington. So again, you're dealing with a public perception that is 30, 40 years old that doesn't match up to the current science. Uh, and the current science needs to get out to people, which is some of what we're trying to do today. Uh, knowing what I know now about marijuana, I wouldn't have touched it in college. I wouldn't touch it today because it's not even near the potency that I had it in college. Okay. And if you ask people, by the way, um, uh, do you think that 99% pure THC, hashish, is less dangerous than alcohol? I, don't, I think you get a different response to that. Okay? It's like the equivalent of a 3-2 beer, what I smoked in college, to pure grain alcohol. Okay, that's the difference between the marijuana then and the marijuana today. So. I'd just like to add one, one, one thing about this, this issue that you both said about whether or not alcohol is more dangerous or marijuana is more dangerous. I, I agree that the bar is really low when you're comparing uh, danger. Um, if you look at the three leading causes of death on the planet Earth, two of them are legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco. So if marijuana is less dangerous than one of the leading causes of preventable death on Earth, does that make it safe? There's one thing that I forgot to mention in my talk. My son Chase had told my wife, Mom, marijuana's not that bad. How could it be that bad? After all, they've already legalized it in a couple of states, and before you know it, it'll be legal across the entire United States. So obviously legalization of marijuana had already sent a message to my son that it couldn't be that bad. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, if you need any information, handouts, links, or whatever, come to me. I'd be glad to hand it to you. Uh, and again, thank you.